is there an ear, nose and throat surgeon in the house? Because I'm going to need him or her at the end of the lecture. The, uh, the walkabout microphone has gone, gone walkabout. Um, so it's a, a shouting match, but I uh, shouldn't be any problem for me. You know, I'm little and with a big voice, you know, as you probably have, have realised. You know. But there's good stuff in little bundles, isn't that right? Um, okay, so last uh, talk that we had, um, some of you uh, still had a nice long lie in uh, as regards the new year. Uh, year one and year two, anybody? Hands up. Any kind of clue? Nobody. Are oh, you up? So you missed the. Uh, Motor? You were here anyway? No, we were here with Jan as we went. Oh, fantastic. Right, okay, so are your colleagues back now? Uh, a little bit, the message is. Can I can give them a message? That, um, if, if the pre clinical students who weren't here at the Motor lecture would like the Motor lecture to be done again, if you contacted me, I'm prepared at an agreeable time, perhaps at lunchtime, okay. to do it. Okay, yeah. but you have to liaise, you know, I can't think through the ether. <coughs> okay. Right, let's get cracking. So can we quiet down, because I've got a problem of, of having to shout. Tonight, um, tonight we're going to do uh, the brain, stem and cranial nerves. I think, after many years of being a neurosurgeon at the brainstem, anatomically it's very complicated. So my, my job is actually to try and make it ultra simple. If, if my, my great friend Terry Parker was here, he'd have a fit in how simple I'm going to make it, uh, missing out a lot of stuff. But I think that what I'm going to try and concentrate on are the aspects of the cranial nerves and the cranial nerve nuclei and the parts of the brainstem which are important clinically. Okay, um, we, we may get on to some more clinical stuff uh, towards the end if we've got time. Remarkably, um, when I ask final year students sometimes, um, can you tell me the um, next slide is? Can I do that again? Oh, well done. Uh, can you give me the three parts of the brainstem? There's a sort of a, a silence, you know. And I think, oh my goodness me, if we're, not, if we're at that level um, of not knowing the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla, then we haven't uh, really grasped the basic uh, anatomy. Now, you may think that's trite, I assure you. you know, it's rather like the you old know, joke, you know, in desperation in an anatomy vibe, I, I mentioned this last week, I asked one of my Liverpool <coughs> students, well, come on, tell me, what is the hole in the bottom of the skull of all this big one here? He said, oh, I know that, it's the foramen magnum. I said, thank goodness, what, what goes through that? He said, the esophagus. And, you know, just... <laughs> or, in fact, he didn't. He said, many a pint of beer has gone down through there, sir. So I thought, no, uh, it's, it's an old joke, actually, as well. So we've got the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla, and we're going to actually look at that. I mean, one of the things that is important about this is to um, realise that the cerebellum roofs um, the fourth ventricle, if I can get this pointed to work. So here is the fourth ventricle, um, and there's the cerebellum over the, the back of it. And when I do surgery on this part, I have to remember some very important nuclei in there. And when I, when I um, am removing a tumour called a medulloblastoma in a child, which tends to grow in this region, the uh, midline of the cerebellum uh, called, anyone know what it's called? The vermis. And, okay? No, it's not called the vermis. It's called the... Huh? It is called the vermis. Sorry. Um, I'm getting mixed up the cerebellum console. And the vermis um, uh, grows a tumour, and there are nuclei in there, and particularly the respiratory and cardiovascular nuclei. So when I'm working there, the anaesthetist says, like, stop, stop, what are you doing? You're actually slowing the heart down. So this is scary neurosurgical stuff, the brain stamp. Okay, let's pass on a bit more. So those are the three parts of the brainstem that we've got to know. And what the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. And when we look at, at the, the, the brainstem from the front and from the back, um, this is the uh, ventral from the front surface uh, of the brainstem. We see, for instance, how close, as you know, the optic nerve, for instance, is to the pituitary gland. So again, it comes as no surprise, knowing that anatomy, that a pituitary tumour is going to press either on an optic nerve, possibly even if it grows back, it's on the optic track, but everybody knows that it presses on the optic chiasm, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Okay, 
Um, we'll talk a bit about vision in, in, in a wee moment. And there's the ponds, the bridge as it's called, because so many things bridge across it, I suppose. And there, last uh, lecture, we were talking about the pyramidal tract, uh, and I said someone thought these looked like the pyramids, uh, and I don't think they look at all like the pyramids, but that's what they are. And so the corticospinal uh, fibers uh, are known as the pyramidal tract, and that's what we talked about um, last time. Look how close the medulla is then to the top of the spinal cord. And we should also, when we look, um, perhaps almost uh, inside, because the idea of this uh, diagram by a wonderful medical artist called Frank Netter is to actually show the cranial nerve nuclei um, sensory uh, or afferent in blue on the left and motor on the right. And we should remember, for instance, the enormous length of the trigeminal uh, nucleus, which we'll come to uh, later on. So it's, it's pretty complicated. Even if we remember that in numerical order, um, the second and third cranial nerve are going to be um, rostral, and therefore in the midbrain, and you can almost work out or guess which, where the nuclei are going to be, because as the numbers get bigger and coming through the ponds, and the 9, 10, 11, and 12 are going to be in the medulla. So it just works like that. That's about the level of anatomy that I had um, as a first year medical student, I think. So we're going to look at the brain stem a bit more. We're going to talk about the exit of the cranial nerves. Mm, they're coarse, maybe. Um, what they do, I think, is important. And, and I think it's more exciting also as a, a clinician to talk about what can go wrong. So let's start off with a, a cranial nerve um, that we tend to ignore, uh, the olfactory. And the olfactory um, uh, is a cranial nerve that I very rarely test. On the other hand, um, it's given rise to a Nobel Prize. Can we turn the lights down a little bit, Hannah? Um, because in 2004, these two people, Richard Axel, who I've actually met, but I haven't let, met Linda Buck, um, they worked out some of the genetics of smell. And smell and olfaction has, has come um, into the neuroscience's uh, top list recently because um, some of the cells that are uh, around this uh, cribriform plate are very interesting stem cells. So we'll probably hear more about olfaction in the next few years as regards clever things. The other interesting thing I, I've recently realized, and you probably said, oh, I knew that a long time ago, is that patients with Parkinson's disease, as a very early symptom, lose their sense of smell way before they actually get the other uh, problems. Did you know that? that there, yeah. Have you been, you've you read that or been taught that? It's an interesting point, isn't it? The, the Parkinson substantia nigra idea is far more complicated than simply just that. Um, from my point of view, um, I have two neurosurgical aspects to olfaction. One is that the commonest cranial nerve to be damaged in head injury is actually number one. Um, so the reason being that this area is a very thin area called the cribriform plate of the ethmoid, ethmoid bone. It's very, very thin. If you held that skull, as it were, up to the light, you would see light shining through it. And therefore, as it's very thin, bangs on the anterior aspect or the anterior fossa floor lead to uh, anosmia and, of course, also <coughs> allow the dura to be torn and cerebrospinal fluid to drip down, uh, which is called CSF rhinorrhea. Um, and usually patients who had that unfortunate situation uh, are at risk of meningitis, by the way, but later on they say, I can't smell anything. That has medical legal significance as well, um, so that if you lose your sense of smell from a head injury which wasn't your fault, you probably get quite a little bit more money for it. It's also got a, uh, a safety aspect, having anosmia, because if you are an elderly person with anosmia, living, say, in a warden control uh, environment, uh, and you've lost your sense of smell, you've lost the very first index of burning smoke. Um, leaving the chip pan on the fire, you know, uh, on, on, the, on the gas stove, which I've done, by the way. My sense of smell is pretty good. Um, smell ends up in the medial aspect of the temporal lobe. I had a patient with a, 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 a mesial or inner aspect uh, temporal lobe meningioma, and that patient had epilepsy, and every time she got a, an epileptic attack, it was preceded by an unpleasant smell aura, which is fascinating, isn't it? This is the uh, old-fashioned rhinencephalon, which is quite small in, in us, but huge in animals like dog. And you can actually see that. 
I actually um, dissected a squirrel the other day. I'll tell you why later if you want to come down and I'll whisper in your ear what had actually happened. But the squirrel uh, that I was uh, dissecting, uh, this is a brain, I mean. Uh,